What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogue John, aka the Seattle Data Guy. Today, we're going to talk about Tom Nash's opinion of Palantir and how he feels it's likely going to replace a lot of the piecemeal components that exist in the modern data stack today. In fact, on the commercial side, nobody out there can give you a full stop shop platform like Palantir. But in all seriousness, he has a great YouTube channel where he covers a lot about stocks and finances, and I've been following him for at least the last year, if not longer. And since he's kind of been dabbling more and more in the Palantir space, I've been thinking about putting out a video both about his general opinion as well as kind of where I see Palantir fitting and maybe some of the problems that I see with it. Because recently he has referenced Palantir as a full-blown rocket ship that will replace things like Informatica, Fivetran, Snowflake, Databricks, and all these other components that we're already very accustomed to in what we're calling the modern data stack. But we have been calling it that for the last three years or so. So it might be time to retire that name as well. To be clear, I do not have an MBA in finance. So anything that has to do with like price to sales or accounting or financial ratios in general are the equivalent of astrological science to me. I have no idea what they mean. And I just assume that somehow the movement of Venus has something to do with calculating all of them. So instead for this video, what I'm gonna focus on is first taking a quick overview of Palantir as a product and kind of where it's trying to fit in. Then I'm gonna discuss some of the issues that I've noticed with uh, Palantir, everything from kind of lack of clarity in what they do, as well as just a general lack of awareness. You know, I've asked a few CEOs and engineers kind of what they think of Palantir, and a lot of them have just either responded with confusion or really not even really fully knowing that Palantir was doing what they're saying they're doing, as well as just playing devil's advocate and trying to round out this opinion with the positives of what I see with Palantir. But let's start with Tom Nash's opinion that Palantir is a rocket ship that is fully built and has every component that you need all in Foundry, which is Palantir's enterprise product. And in order to understand Palantir better, let's look at this diagram with Palantir and AWS and seeing where these different components can kind of tie together. Looking at this diagram, you're going to probably notice some things that are very familiar to you in terms of terminology and some that are maybe new. So let's start with the first step, which is raw transforms and ontology. So I think raw is pretty self-explanatory. This is very similar to any form of modern data stack that I brought up. In general, you've got some sort of source data, whether this is ERPs, CRMs, or just other tools in general, you're likely going to need to pull this data one way or the other. So Foundry will help you pull all that data in, will help create those sources. And once you've created those sources, it can then let you do transforms. Now, most of you who pay attention to the modern data stack knows that this layer is usually taken by DBT which is currently valued to be nearly $6 billion. So in theory, if we're to believe VC valuations, this component alone is worth, again, $6 billion. After that, you have the ontology, which is probably a little confusing and I get it, but really, at least when I've seen pictures of this and kind of going through uh, an example where I found on Reddit, which I'll kind of put up here, this end user's description, along with a few presentations that I've seen, basically make me feel like this is essentially your data warehouse. I'm definitely brushing over a lot of the nuances here, but overall you're kind of referencing entities and events and the attributes that they have, which most of us just know as data warehouse tables. And they call it again, a digital twin of your business, which whenever I'm working with clients to kind of develop a data warehouse, that's really what I describe it as well. You know, it really should just represent your business and all of its transactions, all of its entities, all of its events in one form or another. So that's just kind of an apples to orange comparison of what this is. I'm sure if you had a forward deployment engineer from Palantir view this video, it probably would make them angry that I even referenced these two as the same thing. And so from here, you've actually likely taken care of a lot of the core two or three steps I talk about when you set up a data stack. And so in theory, you can see why Palantir is selling this rocket ship because you see the next section after this, be a general ML ops style layer where you can take models that you've deployed or developed um, in AWS and have them kind of monitored and managed on the uh, Palantir side. So this could be something like Y Labs or something similar to that where they're you know providing some sort of ML ops monitoring. And then of course the final layer, which I think is kind of cool, I'll be honest, is like the whole connection of this to not just visualization layers, which, you know, we have Tableau, we have Looker, we have more um, BI and visualization tools than we need, but they also have an application layer, which I think is fascinating. 
you know, for anyone who's used Retool, that's what I would kind of put here is uh, Retool, which is an easy drag and drop internal tool development system. So if you want to develop some sort of CRUD system or maybe some sort of more interactive visualization that actually allows you to input data and not just, you know, put a few filters in, that's what you have here, essentially, at least based off the demos that I've seen at Foundry. Now that we have a generalized overview of what Palantir does and kind of how it could honestly replace the current data stack tools that we use, the question becomes, will it? And does it have the ability to quickly? Let's dig into some of the challenges that I see for Palantir going forward in this next section. The very first thing that needs to be addressed is the lack of clarity. Now, honestly, I agree with what a lot of Tom has said in the past, but here, when they bring up the fact that, you know, no one really knows kind of what Palantir does. He said this was an advantage, like they are playing some 5D level chess that no one else can see coming. Maybe I, I'm not going to put that past Palantir. Maybe they really are playing some game that I can't see. But I also do spend a lot of time helping data products position themselves kind of in this very convoluted data solutions market. And being confusing is probably one of the last things you want to do. I would highly disagree with that statement. You don't want to be confusing. You want directors or CTOs to understand what your product's going to do in terms of problem solving very quickly, rather than being a very ambiguous tool that's very hard to see the value prop of. Now, specifically, Palantir has developed several tools that solve clear problems, but generally, and in terms of like replacing the data stack, I don't think it's done a great job of letting people know that you even can do this. You know, I have plenty of emails from people who work at top tier tech companies or CEOs of their own tech companies, work at places like Snowflake, and a lot of them are kind of confused on what Palantir even does. And perhaps like this core question asked, maybe Palantir doesn't even want to sell to those markets. They're really focusing on a lot of things like banks and airlines and just generally slower moving companies. So maybe they just fit better in that space. But overall, it just feels like a product that's been overly secretive and now no one really knows what it does. They know it has to do with data. They kind of get that maybe it has something to do with like analysis and analytics. But unless you've worked at a company that has it, you've probably never got to actually try it. The next point I was going to bring up was kind of a lack of partnerships, but more specifically with like consultants such as myself, because when I look at tools like Snowflake, Fivetran and all of these other companies, they do a great job of creating like partnership networks that go beyond just their own teams so they can amplify what they do. You know, if I have a client, I might introduce them to something like Snowflake or Fivetran because I know that they can make their lives easier. And at first, looking at Palantir's partner page, I didn't really seem to see a lot that suggested they had a ton of partners, but I will give them this. I sent a request to partner with them and they got back to me relatively quickly. And I do have a meeting with them. So we're, we're gonna see where that goes. I'm very curious to see kind of how a partnership works with Palantir. This is an important point because another kind of benefit that Snowflake offers is the fact that it plays so well with other solutions and all of these partners and all these account executives really do talk to each other. I watch them kind of all work together to try to make sure that they're all operating to the maximum efficiency and amplifying their selling abilities by increasing the value prop of, again, being the whole rocket ship without being the whole rocket ship. So instead of just having the 3000 or so employees on LinkedIn that Palantir has to do everything from implementation of a product to all of these other tools. You know, Snowflake has the ability to partner with Fivetran and Mode and all these other companies to really amplify their own value prop. Now, another point that Tom brought up is talent. And Palantir is arguably hiring a lot of smart people to work for them, but so is Snowflake and Databricks and every other company. I mean, just take a few seconds to look at the pedigrees of anyone that works at Snowflake, and you'll see a lot of them work for things like BigQuery, which is exactly the tool that Snowflake's basically competing with. And not to mention anecdotally, from that same Reddit user's post, uh, they reference the fact that nine engineers left after three or four months working at Palantir. So, you know, hopefully they don't have a retention issue. But let's be real, this is the internet and this could be anyone's opinion. And I will point out at the bottom of this post, the guy does own Palantir stock. And so do I. So from a talent front, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a moat there. Obviously they hire smart people, but there are plenty of smart people in Silicon Valley working for a whole host of other companies as well that are all directly competing with Palantir. My last challenge that I see Palantir facing is that they are challenging the status quo. There is a ton of marketing that has been put into the modern data stack, Snowflake, which has so much marketing. They have 
tons of developer relations people who are putting out articles and, and basically, you know, tech evangelists who are just selling their product in articles as well as like five trans selling articles about Snowflake. And there's just so many layers here where the concept of the modern data stack is much better cemented in a crystallized way. So it will be very difficult for a company like Palantir to come in and really challenge the status quo. It's like saying you have a better tool than Excel. It could be true. Your product could be 150% what Excel offers, but it takes so much more to replace Excel because it's not just the fact that Excel isn't as good, but the fact that people know Excel, they understand it and replacing it is difficult. So difficult that many companies still rely on it to do most of their analytics. In the same way, the challenge to the status quo doesn't just challenge the technology, it challenges the people who are already cemented in understanding the current tools. And I see this as the biggest hurdle Palantir will have to face. And the fact that it's not, at least in my mind, moving very quickly to kind of close that gap will be a problem in the future from, again, kind of an adoption standpoint. But it is only fair that we also look at what Palantir has going for it. Starting out with deal size. And I believe Tom Nash mentions this in one of his videos. I think he says the average deal size is like $31 million. Um, when I looked up an article, it said five or 6 million, but the general consensus is these are not small projects. These are massive projects and they're giant deals. That could both be good and bad. If we look at Meta or Facebook, for example, they often rely more on their SMBs for their bottom line than they do larger companies. So it's great that Palantir has these million dollar projects, but I think, at least in my experience, Snowflake, I've seen kind of run the gambit. They have market both in the larger companies that are in the billion dollar range, as well as smaller companies that are just in the few million dollar range. And about 80% of my clients are relying on Snowflake. So this point is kind of a toss up. If they can continue to get deals of this size, obviously they will continue to grow rapidly. But I would imagine they do need to start looking at that SMB kind of level, which they actually have as of somewhere mid last year, they've kind of launched a product, I think for free for multiple companies. I'll put up an article here where they were kind of testing this out. So they are attempting to kind of push into that market as well, because there's a lot of new revenue sources there that do add up very quickly. Next, Tom might not be completely incorrect about having the moat of being an entire data stack. Let's just pull up this post from Ethan, the CEO of Portable, who recently discussed the fact that, you know, companies that are essentially features are getting tens of millions, if not billion dollar valuations for something that's essentially a Chrome plugin, but on the data side. And of course, even my perspective on this very post is that eventually there has to be a rumbling where we kind of just centralize all these tools because there's just too many tools, too much spread out talent, and all of it kind of needs to be centralized one way or the other. So maybe, maybe Palantir will solve the problem. Maybe it will be this one rocket ship we've all been looking for and we just don't know it. But I think that is one of the major problems Palantir is facing. And that's kind of my end conclusion here. Palantir, if they have built a rocket ship, isn't that well known, except for the places that they've done a lot of marketing or a lot of sales into. Maybe it's because I spent the last few years in the ivory tower that is San Francisco. But overall, the people that I've talked to in this space, whether it be consultants who are implementing other solutions or CEOs of their own data solutions companies, they all are kind of confused on how Palantir will replace them. And it's like I've said before for yourselves, you could be the best engineer in the world, you could be the best product in the world. But if no one knows that you exist or no one can kind of crystallize mentally where you fit, it's not a great place to be because you're very difficult to sell. Anyways, guys, that is my overall conclusion here. So I think Tom Nash has a lot of good points on what Palantir can offer. I'm just concerned about Foundry's adoption in more companies at a rapid enough rate to compete with what is currently being adopted. This is kind of like the Betamax versus VHS issue where it's like maybe Betamax was better technology, but VHS had better adoption. So Palantir could have the best technology, but at the end of the day, if all of these other tools are just easier to adopt because they're modularized, which might be why Alex Carp is planning to modularize Foundry itself, maybe because it's hard to maybe sell as a whole package, which might be why Alex Carp is deciding to kind of modularize some of Foundry, maybe to make it easier to sell and adopt for people so people can kind of understand where it fits in their whole data stack. But then if that is the case, it takes away the rocket ship. And now you've just scrapped it for parts. Truthfully, as Tom kind of pointed out, only time will tell. We will see if Palantir can get enough adoption. That's my biggest concern. Will there be enough adoption quickly enough to compete with the other contenders? Hopefully now you understand what Palantir does, how it kind of fits into the data stack world, 
the challenges that it faces and possibly where it could go in the next four to five years, depending on adoption. And I wanted to kind of give you the conclusion that I had after thinking about this longer, which to start out with, let's just talk about the fact that, you know, comparing Snowflake to Palantir is a little bit like comparing apples and oranges. They are two products that do have some crossover in functionality. What is more fair to say is it's not Palantir versus Snowflake, but instead Palantir versus everything in terms of the fact of the modern data stack, right? Like if we were to look at the modern data stack, you know, look at this image I'm going to put up here. Everything you see here, basically Palantir has some sort of analogous pair to. Palantir has kind of had this centralized approach to develop all of this internal tooling to solving big data problems for the government and then has kind of pushed that out towards Foundry. On the same side or flip side, we've had this decentralized approach where kind of Snowflake kind of led the charge. And around that has come other tools, such as things like Fivetran to develop things like data connectors, Looker that has kind of was developed around the same time in 2012 as, as uh, Snowflake. And so a lot of these tools that you'll see, data catalogs, all these components exist in both spaces. So it's important to realize it's not necessarily Snowflake versus Palantir, but again, Palantir versus everything. But with all that said, let's kind of compare these two, but in two different categories, because I think that will make it a little bit simpler. Um, because this is a very, I think, more nuanced discussion where it's not versus clearly, it's a little bit um, blurry in terms of where the, the versus is. First, um, I think it's important to think about the SMB market. Snowflake has created a service that is affordable for a much larger range of people. Um, you know, in the past, if you wanted to have some sort of data warehouse or data analytics storage system, you had to pay a lot of money for licensing costs, you know, server costs, and all of this. So SMBs, in some cases, were out of luck. So Snowflake has created its own market in that space, and Palantir, let's just be straightforward, can't touch that space currently. It's too expensive for most um, smaller companies to use, so there's no way they can afford it. This is kind of the same thing that Facebook did with advertising in the sense that, you know, it used to be in order to afford advertising, you'd have to pay a lot of money to get any form of placement. But eventually, you know, you can do very targeted um, ads to a very limited uh, group of people for 50 bucks. The same thing here with Snowflake, you know, you can pay as you go versus having to pay for, again, all this licensing costs and server space and then someone to manage all of this. So, so far, I would say that Palantir and Snowflake, if you're really going to compare those two, um, Palantir can't touch the SMB market, at least not on the lower end. Now, when you're looking at Fortune 500 companies, the ones that can actually afford that $5 million price tag, yes, I think Palantir has a much better chance of trying to manage a lot of the workflow, a lot of that data workflow. Um, but I think Snowflake is already in a lot of Fortune 500 companies as well. Snowflake is just so easy to adopt that I think a lot of companies have kind of started to integrate it into various layers um, of their data systems. But I think where Palantir will kind of definitely shine a lot is more on that ML side. Um, I think that is still a major struggle for most companies to deal with, you know, ML ops, machine learning in general. Um, someone that can solve that problem, you know, the one that was kind of listed out in Google's paper um, almost a decade ago at this point about, you know, machine learning technical debt. Uh, that is a huge proposition that I think if they can take that space will garner them a lot of value. And then again, they're not necessarily going to be versing Snowflake directly. There are some aspects that they do kind of compete with in terms of like, you know, data warehouse versus kind of the ontology approach, um, both kind of involve, you know, managing data slightly differently. But I see one more as a workflow tool, which is Palantir, and the other one more as a tool that, that can be used for any form of ad hoc analysis. And that's what I see in terms of Snowflake. So overall, it is a very apples to oranges kind of comparison. I think in the SMB space, you're going to continue to see Snowflake and its partners uh, dominate because it's just more affordable for most people. And Palantir, I think, will probably find its place and its home more on the workflow and ML side of things versus purely on like the data storage and, and connector space.